you know, some children are kinesthetic learners. They learn better standing on their heads than they do sitting in a chair. We want them to love being read to. It's a privilege. It's never a punishment. Today on the Maiden Parent Podcast, we are airing an interview that Brett and I did with our friend Carol Joy Side on the topic of helping your kids love reading. Now, Carol has been someone who has had a big influence on our own life mm -hmm. and the life of our kids because she's really influenced the way we've seen education, we've viewed education. And when we talk to Carol, it is just a delight. <laughs> and I say that and I'm thinking, that's what old people say. <laughs> But I want to and make this relevant for you. And you realized you're getting old. Honey. No, I was making this relevant <laughs> for you. Um, no, that that's the way to describe our conversation mm -hmm. with her and and what she brings. She's just such a joyful person, but mm -hmm. she's smart. Mm -hmm. And she has some really good things about how do we help develop a culture of reading in our homes mm -hmm. and how do we get our kids to love reading so this is a this is a great interview yeah i hope you enjoy this conversation and that it is an encouragement to you to make uh reading a big part of your family hey everyone we are here with a special guest her name is carol joy side and uh, carol has kind of a, a special place in Aaron and my heart <laughs> because she was a huge resource to us when we really first started trying to think biblically about our kids' education, which for our family led us to decide to homeschool. We ended up going to one of Carol's seminars and it, it just, it really, I mean, I don't think it's an overstatement to say it kind of revolutionized our view, helped us to make a huge paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, uh, I think we walked away with was that this woman was a wise sage. <laughs> I mean, we really felt we, we, we got to hear her wisdom. Anyway, I could go on and on, but Carol, you've had a huge influence on us. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so honored to be with you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, if you want to find uh, find out more about Carol and uh, her speaking, her resources, uh, all that she's doing, you can go to her website, which is caroljoyside.com. Uh, uh, but and we'll tell we'll talk to you guys more about those resources at the end of this. Mm -hmm. But Carol, here's here's what we want parents to do: whether they are homeschooling or whether they have their kids in private school or public school, we always want to help parents think biblically about parenting and mm -hmm. about education mm -hmm. and you know in our view i think the, the, the christian worldview uh tells us that education is not just academic achievement education is the formation of the entire person yes. and it's a it's, it's a kind of life and so and, and you know and those are i think that's some of that is just your influence on us in mm -hmm. in kind of viewing education but here's what we want to talk about with you carol because i think you were so formative in, in, in thinking about this particular aspect of education, but it's the, the, the idea of literature. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, uh, uh, Carol, what, what do you see as the role of literature in education? What should be the role of, of literature in education? Mm. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think that education is reading. I know that sounds simplistic, but... Um, when I was a young college student, I lived in Oxford, England for a while and was going to art school in London. And when we'd meet cute boys on the high street there in Oxford, we didn't want to act like we were Yankees, you know, Americans. So we would, we would be very cool and we would use their language, which is, so what are you reading? Because at Oxford, you don't say, what are you majoring in or what are you studying or you know, whatever it is, what's your degree going to be in? You, they literally just say, what are you reading? Well, I'm reading Grace, or I'm reading Histophilo, or I'm reading, um, you know, whatever it is. And so, excuse me, so I, I think the understanding that all education historically is basically reading. And a lot of schools in America are really glomming onto this concept I think St. John's Annapolis probably was the first to create a great books course that revolutionized America, but a school like Shimer in Chicago 
or um, I think Pepperdine Hillsdale certainly has a great books course. My favorite would be Biola in La Mirada, which has something called the Tory Honors Program, where based on the Oxford model, uh, kids read the canon of great books. They read the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, um, that type of book. And then they sit with a professor in a living room and drink tea. And they talk about the book because reading is the basis of all education. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that that whole idea is is probably foreign to a lot of uh, definitely American parents. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I think for a lot of parents, they actually don't see their kids reading very much at, you know, they're not getting a whole lot of reading from their local public school or private school. Why do you, why do you think that is? You know, um, I think a lot of educators aren't reading themselves. So we don't really have a literate uh, populace, you know, in the time of uh, Charles Dickens, when he was writing and um, I'm sure you know, but they serialized his his books. So when he was reading, writing David Copperfield or, or um, The Old Curiosity Shop, for example, when he was writing that book, it came out in magazines one chapter at a time. And the whole world, not really the whole world, but the English speaking world hung until the next time that that next chapter was going to be revealed in the next magazine. And so when little Nell was hanging by a thread in the old curiosity shop, the, the story is told that the longshoremen in New York City, you can imagine burly guys with big tattoos and muscles, when the ship arrived from England, they shouted to the, the, sh the guys on the ship, did little Nell die? because they were all reading Charles Dickens, The Long Shoreman in New York City. Yeah. I mean, talk about a change. <laughs> Today in America, the average college graduate does not read one book a year, mm. not one. So what are they doing with their time? I'll tell you what they're doing with their time. They're looking at screens and um, they're, sadly, really losing their ability to think on a high level very often. Um, you know, the, the understanding of logical thought is really taught through reading. Mm -hmm. And um, I like to say, people are like, well, are you going to teach logic? Are you going to teach? And, and those things are very helpful. And I love all of them. But the truth of the matter is that if you've spent your days reading you know, Henry James and Jane Austen and Solzhenitsyn, you're going to start thinking like the people that you spend time with. And if those are the people you're spending time with, you become like them. Mm -hmm. And so reading kills about 18 birds with one stone <laughs> and it's painless. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's what I love about you, the seminar that we went to so many years ago that, that it, you, you, opened up the door to all that literature can bring to our family. And so, so thinking of parents today, Carol, what, where, if, if a parent's listening to you and going, okay, I, I know that's true. Um, where, where do I start? So where can a parent, um, you know, right now we're, we're all still kind of under quarantine. So we do have a little more time, but even when, if the world gets back to normal and, and the kids are back in school and work and every, where, where do you, where would you advise small changes maybe, or, or that a family can make that shift towards literature as yeah. a family? Well, that's a great question, Erin. I guess a couple things. One, um, if you can read and your children can't, um, that's a wonderful opportunity to just model. I mean, they think you're a genius if you can read Hop on Pop. And so starting with right where your kids are um, and just reading for entertainment, reading for pleasure, reading for bonding, building space in your day where this is what we do. We read just like we brush our teeth or we, you know, whatever our family routine is, mm -hmm. we read. Mm -hmm. And um, years ago, I was working at a health food store an hour uh, an afternoon a week to get a discount and I met this very sharp attractive young high school girl and she told me she was not a Christian she told me that she had been raised in a home without a television set and I said really 
because that's what I teach people to do. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, oh, it was great. We, you know, we loved it. She said, the only thing was when we went to school, she went to the public school in a very affluent suburb of Chicago. She said, when we went to school, sometimes people would give us a hard time and they would say things like, oh, you don't have a television? What? What do you guys do? And she said, I would look at them and say, we read books. Yeah. <laughs> and I loved it because it's a family culture. It's just like, like, I don't know if you know, Dr. Sears, the pediatrician, but um, he and his sons wrote a darling book and they talked about, well, in our family, we just don't go down that aisle in a supermarket or in our family, we don't eat foods with, that have numbers and letters in their ingredients. Like it's like our family culture. We just don't do that. And so creating the family culture of we're a family of readers, we read. And so just start by reading. Most families have a few books in their house, not, not a lot. Um, I hate to recommend this, but if you don't have any and you're, and you're surrounded, you know, with this quarantine situation, I guess you could just do eBooks. It wouldn't be my choice. One dad came up to me in a seminar and he said, Carol, when I'm, I'm a pastor and when I read to my, uh, when I'm reading my Bible, I intentionally do not use an electronic screen to do that. He said, because even though I'm reading my Bible, my children don't know what I'm reading. And so they're like, well, daddy could be checking his Facebook for all we know. We don't. So he said, it's so important to me to read an, an embodied book that physically tells my children I'm reading a book, a real book with pages and paper. And so I think it's always so important if we can read a real book to do it and to love books, to hug them, to smell them, to decorate with them. Um, our children value what we value and you can order books online while you're home. And so that would be a great place to start is just start ordering some great books um, and, and they can be simple, simple things like the carrot seed or the ox cart man. I mean, it doesn't have to be war and peace to be a great book, but a book that has stood the test of time and that um, your child will beg for one more chapter. That's a great book. And so now, building a library. Go ahead. So, yeah, uh, think, thinking through, I mean, this whole day, the idea of books, I, let's be clear, especially in terms of education, some parents might be saying, well, my kids do read books but they read textbooks. You're not talking about textbooks. No, I'm talking about books where your child wants to read them under a cover with a flashlight. That's okay. what we're looking Great for. Great definition. Here. Good definition. <laughs> and and I, I don't know any high school or junior high or elementary school kid that wants to read a textbook, textbook under the covers of a flashlight. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because yeah. so, I mean, so there's so much of modern education seems to be in, a, in textbooks and worksheets and yeah you know, those yeah. kind of things. And it, it, I think if parents sit back and reflect a little bit, the, that, the kids don't enjoy that. Um, it, it's, it becomes so tedious. And, and, you, and you watch your kid in that, you know, kind of, kind of get exposed to that year after year after year. And it just seems like a lot of kids today, particularly by the time they're fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they, they, they've lost the love of learning. Yes. And is it, are, are books a way that, that we can help them preserve that love of learning? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. It is the way. Um, and it's so simple. And, you know, some libraries, even though they're closed, will bring books out to your car if you order them. So hopefully it even can be completely free. It doesn't have to cost any money. It just costs investment in our children. And we love our children, let's face it. And we'll, we'll take a bullet for our children. So when I say to you, I want you to read your kids, let's, let's aim for 45 minutes a day at first. And, and I don't know any parent that wouldn't say, well, I can do that. And then eventually you're reading more and more, maybe a couple times a day and then at lunch or after lunch, before, after dinner, before bed, you know, you build it into your day. And of course, the key is daddy reading out loud. And uh, the wonderful thing about dads working from home now is that they can fit in this reading time with their families a little bit more easily. But even, you know, when I have traveled the world and I say to people, okay, so maybe, maybe daddy's flying to China for work, but he brings his little book that you're reading with him 
And then he FaceTimes at your bedtime, maybe not his bedtime in China, but there's a way to make this happen. When there's a will, there is a way. And what you value, your children will value. What you spend your money on, your children will want to spend their money on. It's just your modeling that mm -hmm. first you read to your kids and then you be a reader yourself. And then you build a literary environment in your home. And those are the things that will really contribute to making your children lifelong learners. And the, um, the National Endowment for the Arts under Dana Joya uh, did research on this. And they found that the number of books found in a child's childhood home was directly, statistically, related to the level of academic success that they had in their future life. If there were few books, there was little success. If there were many books, there was great success. It was in every case studied, and it had nothing to do with the educational level of the parent or the financial you know, security of the home. None of that mattered. The only thing that mattered were the number of books found in the person's childhood home. Would you say, uh, so I'm just thinking about a parent out there who might be saying, hey, my kids are in junior high or high school now. We haven't created this culture in our home and our kids don't like to read. Uh, it, it, is, it, it's, is it too late? Never. Yeah. It's never too late. And let me give you a couple book suggestions that are readily available. And I've never met a family that didn't enjoy these books. So depending on your children's age, um, when they're little, I'd love families to start with the little house books. They're everywhere. They're very easily accessible and you can get them as eBooks. Yuck, but you can. And, um, and so just start reading the little house books to your kids. If you have a primarily male audience, read Farmer Boy which stands alone. The other books are all about Laura and Mary and their childhood. And the books are based on Laura's childhood. So what's the first question every child asks is, did this really happen? And the answer with the Little House books is, yes, it did. So um, those would be a great place to start. Another wonderful stepping into reading as a family would be the Narnia books. And you can start with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Or I personally like to start with the Magician's Nephew, which is the first book in the chronology of the stories, but not the first book that Lewis wrote. So those, again, are very easily found in a library. You can buy them online used inexpensively. And I don't know a family that doesn't enjoy reading those books at any age, because as C.S. Lewis said, a book worth reading at five is also worth reading at 55 and vice versa. So a good book has no age. Two books that are not as well known, but I highly recommend, are Tales of the Kingdom and Tales of the Resistance by David and Karen Maines. And I like them uh, to be illustrated by Jack Stockman. Um, they've been re-illustrated, but I, I'm not fond of the new illustrations. But those books have spiritual depth that will knock your socks off. And your um, nine-year-old will love it, your 12-year-old will love it, and your 18-year-old will love it. And you'll be like weeping on the floor because you're so blessed by, you know, the ministry of these books. So because they really have no age, they're a little scary because they're spiritual warfare. So don't read them to your four-year-old and then say sweet dreams because that's probably not going to be a good fit. But about nine and up until adulthood, they're universal. Um, there's so many books. A fun book to read as a family is A Walk Across America. Um, the true story of a young man who literally walked across America and in the process uh, met the Lord, Jesus Christ. And so it was a bestseller. People loved the book, even though they necessarily didn't even agree with the spiritual content. So there's so many great books. Uh, you don't want to waste your time with mediocre books, reading books like Diary of a Wimpy Kid or, you know, that kind of Judy B, whatever, Jones or whatever her name is, you know, that's like, yuck. I mean, if you're going to read, if you're going to turn the phones off and put a do not disturb sign on the door and, you know, everybody's in one place at one time, what a miracle. And then you pull out some mediocre book. Ah, if you don't love it, why do you think your children will love it? So people read, you know, like Berenstein Bears. I mean, no offense, but they're so lame. 
And so, you know, you, you get everyone together and you're going to read. It's a miracle. And daddy's going to do it. And it's so cool. And then he reads this book that he's just like, this is boring me to tears. And guess what? It's boring your children to tears too. They don't even know because they've never read really great books. But, um, you know, you want to pick your battles. You want to read what I call barn burners that um, your kids will just beg. I remember we were reading um, The Long Winter from the Little House books. And my son kept saying, one more chapter, one more chapter, one more chapter, until basically read the whole book. It's like, that's the kind of book you want to read with your children. You don't want to read books that they're like begging to get out of it, you know? Yeah. And when, when daddy reads, I think that also sends a very significant message that this is something important, that real men read books, that daddy values this. Um, I think that's really a key too. Yeah, and I, would just, I wanna encourage parents uh, because I think there are so many uh, Christian families that this reading is just not part of your culture. Yeah. And, and you think, you may think your kids are too old and it's too late. And I just want to reiterate what Carol's saying here. It's not too late. You know, it is not too late for people to develop this culture, but it also takes time. And so if you think you're going to sit down with, you know, one night and start reading a book and it hasn't ever happened before with the family, mm -hmm. and then all your kids are going to just come running and love it. No, but it's a culture that you build. And it's like any good thing that takes time and cultivation before you, you kind of harvest, mm -hmm. you know. So true. You know, that is so true, Brett. I, I say to families, go up to any Olympic gold medalist and say, so you didn't have to, like, sacrifice anything for this, did you? And they'll, like, roll on the floor laughing. And, and ask their parents, well, did you have to sacrifice anything for this? Are you serious? Like this took our entire life savings, our world, our, you know, every bit of spare money and time we had in the last 20 years to get to this day. It's anything, like you said, worth doing is it's a sacrifice. But um, you're, and, and the one thing that I think we need to emphasize too, and, and of course the three of us certainly share this vision, is that as believers in Jesus, we're people of the book. And so if we're not readers, how are we going to read the word of God? We're not literary people. That troubles me because everywhere that biblical Christianity has gone, people have become literate. When you study the history of literacy, it's, it's been based on biblical literacy first and foremost. I mean, that's really what the Reformation really brought about and so if our children are not readers and if we're not readers how long will it be before christianity is just a non-issue in our life yeah i i love your encouragement um to families to read together to just start 30 45 minutes a night um to have dad help lead the way in changing the culture and, and also too, Carol, I, I know you talk about, you know, it, it doesn't have to be kids sitting there crisscross completely still. Um, that family reading time together respects children where they're at. And sitting still doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're listening. And so talk a little bit about that, of just giving people a picture. It, it might be messy and 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 even and at first when you're trying to create the culture you might have to drag some teenagers along but um so what what does it look like to have a family reading time together well with little children i i'm not above bribery i'll feed them while you know i'm reading to them put them in a high chair they're a captive audience and give them you know finger food while you're holding a little book and reading to them with a happy voice and and, you know, when the children are really little, Erin, you don't even have to read the book. You just kind of can look at, oh, where's the duck? <gasps> what's the boy doing? <gasps> Uh-oh, what's, you know, and, and they're just like telling you because toddlers don't want you to do anything. They want you to do it. They want to do it themselves. <laughs> but then as they get older, maybe letting them uh, paint or draw or crochet or knit or, of course, eat. Older kids love to eat as well. Um, and going to a comfortable place. Don't sit in like dining room chairs if you're not eating, but you know, go and sit on the porch swing or under a tree on a picnic blanket 
or um, just find somewhere really cozy, of course, in front of a fireplace. Um, make lovely hot drinks. Um, I'm about to do a podcast on Edith Schaefer, and I'm sure that you're very familiar with the, the Schaefers, but Francis and Edith Schaefer, um, all of their adult lives, they read out loud to each other. They read out loud to whoever was living with them. And of course they read out loud to all their children and they would create this whole ambiance of they'd make this special, beautiful hot drink and the lovely teacups that Edith would collect and the lovely tray and she'd bake something and they, they'd set the stage. And when her daughter Susan and daughter and son-in-law Ranald were running the ministry in England called La Brie, um, they would read out loud every night as a family in front of the fire. And um, they would always have guests staying with them because the nature of their ministry was it was a residential ministry. And so people would be included in the reading. And then if their children's friends were over, they had company, whatever. It was just like, that's what we do after dinner is we gather in front of the fire and we read. And so Susan was talking about how years later, one of her children's, of course, her children are now parents and maybe even grandparents, but years and years later, they came back to visit with them. And, and this the young woman, or maybe she was married by then, said, tell me, do you guys still read out loud together at night? And Susan said, oh, yes, definitely. And then this friend of her daughter, I think it was Fiona's friend, she said, they should write a book about your family. Like it just made such an impact on this little girl who was over for dinner, you know, and like, well, after our family's done, you know, we eat in front of the television, you know, and it's just, it's creating a family culture and then making it really fun. So we never want, you know, some children are kinesthetic learners. They learn better standing on their heads than they do sitting in a chair. We want them to love being read to. It's a privilege. It's never a punishment. And so if they want to do play with their Legos, as long as they're not going, <laughs> you know, sometimes Legos are so loud as they're digging through them, but whatever they would do, that would be fun to them. That would make inc increase the pleasure. Now, some children are cuddlers. They just want to cuddle up next to you. And, and, and that's their favorite thing to do, or you rub their back while you're reading them. And that's great. But other children would feel like they're being tortured by that. So we always want them to feel that being read to is a privilege and a, and a fun thing that we do for entertainment, never, never as a punishment. So don't say, be, they can be quiet and you can, you sh certainly can say, you guys, you have to be quiet. You can't like make your dolls talk to each other while I'm reading, you know, or make your things explode. You know, little boys make motor noises. That, you know, you can do that later. You have to do something, you can play, but you have to play quietly because mommy's reading or daddy's reading and when someone's reading, um, we, that's a very, that's a magical time in our day and we don't want anything to interrupt it. So making them realize that it's a privilege, like when, um, children are little saying things like, you know, if you are really good, I bet daddy will read two chapters tonight, a farmer boy, instead of one, like all day long, you're building it up that this is what we do for, for rewards and for fun. And this is our family's culture. Yeah, and, and I, I, let's let's talk to the parent out there who maybe okay, they're at the beginning of this. They have little ones. Yeah. What are the kinds of things that they can do yeah. to to build that family culture so that reading becomes, you know, the, something their kids just grow up with? I mean, what are the best things that a parent can do besides? Yeah, uh, or, or I guess I maybe think, coach that you that parent of the young kid. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Brett, putting them on your lap, giving them lots of skin to skin, cuddling time. This is the happiest time of the day. We don't sit on the edge of a waterbed and read or, you know, we make it really cozy and we read at the right time of day. So if when they wake up, they're real cozy and cuddly, that's a great time to read. If uh, after lunch, before nap, that tends to be a great time before bed. You know, when they've been running around all day and they're mellow and they're peaceful, they've just come out of the bathtub and they're all rosy and shiny and, and they cuddle up with you. Or um, a, lot of, a lot of times families read in bed, in mommy and daddy's bed. Everybody hops in the bed and everyone, get out of the way, move over, I wanna see. And everyone's all together cuddling and loving on each other and reading together. Um, I think 
when you read to a child, read a, use a happy voice and use the best books. So, you know, in my seminars, I give um, book lists, but uh, some resources that families could get even within an hour would be Honey for a Child's Heart by Gladys Hunt or Books Children Love by Elizabeth Wilson or the Read Aloud Handbook by Jim Trelease. Um, he may not share my spiritual views quite at the level of the other two books I mentioned, but he still will really put a fire under you about reading out loud as a family and he will inspire you. But those books all contain book lists. And so when you're gonna read your children, read the best books that generations of children have loved. And that's why I tend to read old books because then we know it has a track record. It has stood the test of time, which is the definition of a classic. And so reading a book like, like I talk about the four pillars of Western civilization, for example. So for your young children, the first would be a complete set of Beatrix Potter. That'll be like 19 little handheld books, not cheap, but the best money you ever spend. So the Tale of Gloucester, the Tale of Two Bad Mice, Peter Rabbit, Benjamin Bunny, um, et cetera. So there's 19 of these little books. You've got to have those. And then uh, Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, who wrote uh, for his son when his son was away with his nanny at, at the seashore. He sent him a chapter every day. And um, again, these books have stood the test of time. Both of them have been in print well, well over 100 years, and they're still bestsellers. And then A Child's Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson. And I like to see that illustrated by Jesse Wilcox Smith. And teaching your kids poetry so they can memorize. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me. And what can be the use of him is more than I can see. And they can easily memorize these poems. They don't even know they're memorizing. You're just reading them over, over, over and over again. And then the fourth pillar of Western civilization are the A.A. Milne books. Um, Winnie the Pooh, House of Pooh Corner, and which are prose, and then two books of poetry, Now We Are Six and When We Are Very Young. And every nursing infant will love hearing the poems of A.A. A. Milne, the, the Winnie the Pooh poems. John had a great big waterproof Macintosh. John had a great big waterproof hat. John had great, oh, I'm saying it wrong. Anyway, great big waterproof boots on Macintosh hat. And that, said John, is that. And so all these A.A. Milne poems that your nursing baby will love the rhythm, the cadence, the voice of mommy as she's just, you know, when they're infants, they're getting literary training kind of in their DNA. And, and that will make them lovers of books when they can figure out how to break that code. Believe me, they want to because you've taught them that this is a magic kingdom and they want to get into it. Yeah, we were going to ask you, that leads perfectly to my next question about kids reading on their own. Um, read aloud with your kids. And then today there is so much pressure on little ones to be reading, um, you know, by four years old. And um, some kids do, you know, read young. Um, but we've, we've, believed this idea that kids should be reading now by the time they started kindergarten, which, which wasn't the case when, when I was in kindergarten and certainly wasn't the case when my grandmother was five years old. Um, so I, I know you have a lot to say on this topic, but just to, to help parents relax in this area, um, talk to us about when it's normal uh, yes. for a child to break the code of reading. Yeah, it's a great question. So I just did a podcast on this and it was called Better Late Than Early. And um, I listened to it yesterday and I was getting blessed. And it, I mean, not because anything of that I said, but because of the research that I was sharing and the books that I read before I did the podcast or reread. Um, so my podcast is called um, Homeschool Made Simple. And it was just last week's, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and I it listened to it. So I know exactly what you're okay. talking about. And it was a blessing because of, of the research, Carol, that you have done. Yes. On well, I, and it's not anything I done. That's just it, Erin. It was research that I was just quoting from yes, people. The Moors. Yeah. That you, and you introduced us to uh, Raymond and Dorothy Moore. 
who have done, yeah, so much work in this area. But go ahead. Yes, I love that podcast. And (laughs) I did too, even though I was speaking. I mean, it was just hilarious that I was getting blessed listening to my own podcast. But the point is that I want families to do their research. And um, the research is so clear on this. The the Scandinavian countries um, have the highest literacy rates in the world. And in all four of them, they don't teach children to read until at least seven. And it's interesting because when Dr. Moore, who you just mentioned, was founding the homeschool movement many, many years ago, he, in his original writings, he he didn't even talk about homeschooling. It wasn't even a term. He just talked about delayed academics and based it on 8,000 studies that he and his wife, Dorothy, did with the Hewitt Moore Foundation. And what they found is that the later a child learns to read, the better a reader they will be in the long run, and the lower will be their incidence of reading failure and learning disability. So we have never had a higher illiteracy rate than we have in America right now, never in the history of America. And our highest literacy rate was in the time of the Civil War, when we were a one-room schoolhouse, governess, you know, tutor kind of um, kingdom. And that was when we had the best literacy rates. And so this idea, get them while they're young, in utero flashcards, uh, there's no research to back it up, none whatsoever. And that's why I recommend that people uh, listen to that podcast. And I hope then you'll want to read the book, which is a little hard to find, Better Late Than Early. Also, School Can Wait. And in those original books of research uh, for the uh, Office of Education in Washington, D.C., where Dr. Moore worked and when he was compiling all this, what they found was that um, that eight or nine was what they were recommending that you teach children to read at eight or nine. So I like to tell families, let's wait till seven, at least if they're boys, eight might be better, but at least don't don't start reading uh, training, formal training, till your children are at least seven. And if it's agony at seven, put it away, but read to them by the hour. And believe me, even if your child has a learning disability, like a dyslexia situation, what Jim Trelease talks about in his Read Aloud handbook, he says, even a child with dyslexia, the best thing you can do for them is read out loud to them because you're advertising reading to them. And so they're going to have to teach themselves to read because every dyslexic child's brain works a little differently than, you know, the next person's brain. But that's the secret of their success and why they tend to be brilliant people and why so many great people, John Kennedy, Winston Churchill, Francis Schaeffer, uh, were dyslexics. And, and that was the secret to their success because they had to figure out how to teach themselves to read because traditional methods didn't work. So regardless of, of what the situation is, if you read to your child, that's the most important thing. And if you wait till your child is ready because you want their first exposure to be, I love this. I am so good at this. When can I do more? And Dorothy Moore used to call that, give your child success experiences every day. And that's what we're looking for. And if we, if we wait for readiness, then their chances of success are so much greater. Yeah. And that, I, that whole idea, I think for modern parents yeah. is, is so radical. They've, and this is where parents need to, I think, understand how the culture socializes us and gets us to think about these things. Cause I bet if you ask a hundred parents, Hey, is it better for your kid to read at five or six or better for them to read at eight or nine? It's always going to be five or six. It's just been kind of ingrained into us that early is better. And so what you're saying for a lot of people who might be listening is, is kind of radical, but it is backed up by really good research and a lot of lived experience. And, uh, but it's a major paradigm for uh, a paradigm shift for a lot of parents. Yeah. Uh, and it might actually be, uh, some people listening might be relieved to hear what you're saying because- when you're at, when you're, you see your child struggling, you know, your heart breaks for a five-year-old that's struggling to read or, 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 and then parents have this fear. Oh no, do they, do they have a learning disability? Do, is there something wrong? Is there something I've done? 
So even the idea that this is a new idea that kids would read so early, that, that for most of human history, right. we've allowed children to be children. And then when they're ready to um, figure out the code of letters and reading, um, that's when they were ushered into that. So just an encouragement to some parents that you, you might have been getting pressure from a school or a grandparent. Why, isn't, why aren't they reading? They should be reading by now. Um, maybe they shouldn't be reading by now. Maybe, maybe it's okay. And that what we have found with our five children is, um, is just that, that when I was able to give them the time to wait to read, it did happen more, more, more than, than, um, not, it was around the age of eight or nine. And then they start reading and they love reading. And they're getting in trouble for not turning off their nightlight <laughs> because it's 1030 and they are still up reading and they don't, they start reading and they don't start with phonics, but you know, they, they're not reading the, the junk. They're starting with Charlotte's Web. They're starting with Narnia and, right. and they just jump and catapult into the world of books on their own so true. because they were allowed the time just to <sighs> read. You know, and so yeah. just to encourage parents, we did what Carol's talking about after going to her seminar with her advice, and we have just seen the fruits of that in our own children. I'm so glad. Yeah. You okay. give your children such an edge in life, and yeah. the research from the National Endowment of the Arts showed that children who are readers mm -hmm. even score higher in math and science that reading gives your kids an edge in every aspect. And if you're reading the right books, it's gonna give them an edge spiritually in their spiritual development and their character, um, which is way more important than how smart they are. Yeah. But everybody worries about how smart they are. That's fine, they'll be smart, but let's make sure they're godly and then, then we'll worry about them being smart. Yes. So. Okay, before we let you go, Carol, I, I, ha I wanna talk just briefly about biographies because oh, I know you are passionate about biographies. I think it's a great thing for families to, if they're gonna start reading together, biographies is a wonderful way to yes. do that. So talk to us a little bit about biographies um, and how families can bring this into their reading too. Yeah, so there's a, um, a publishing house in Scotland called Christian Focus. And um, my son, who is a, a pastor, was um, at a conference, I think it was Together for the Gospel or Gospel Coalition, I can't remember, a big conference in Chicago, and I ran into the city to have lunch with him. And, and Tim Keller was speaking, and it hadn't gotten out yet, and so I went into the book room, of course, and it was this massive room with all theological tomes, you know, stacked to the ceiling, all these different publishers from all over. And I'm running through there knowing I just have like 10 minutes before he gets out. And I'm running through looking, are there any children's books here? And finally, I find one table. And the people are from Scotland. They'd flown in. They, they're, all their last names were Mackenzie. And they had very um, heavy Scottish accents. And they had all these biographies for children. And I'm just going like this, you know, stacking them up. And, and I got a bunch of them. And then we began to build a relationship. And we would talk from Scotland to America. And uh, they would send me, you know, and, and we still have that relationship going. Um, but these biographies are unique on many levels. For one thing, the British and Scottish publishers do not write downward or speak downward. I don't know what the term is to children like American publishers do, you know, we think children are kind of not so bright, but the British and the, and people from the British Isles um, treat children with respect. And that was something that the great educator Charlotte Mason really taught. We treat children with respect. And so these biographies do not, they're not watered down. They're very meaty. They're very well written. So they have a series of biographies for little kids. We'll start with those. And those are called the little lights. And they're just really picture books for very young children. But um, my granddaughter, one day I was talking to her about prayer. She was about four years old. And I said something about 
prayer and she said, well, you know, Grammy, sometimes God says yes. And sometimes he says no. And, and sometimes he says, wait, she said, you know, like Amy and blue eyes. And I said, you know about Amy Carmichael? And she goes, well, yes. And you know, God said no when she asked for blue eyes, but later it was really important that she have brown eyes. Like, oh my word. <laughs> and then we were reading about Helen Rosevere praying for the baby doll, for the two little girls whose mother had died in equatorial Africa. And the children were praying that she would get a hot water bottle for the new baby that had been born when the mother died. And she thought, where would I ever get a hot water bottle in equatorial Africa? And she said to the other children there on the compound, the little African children, children, I need you to pray with me about this. And she said, Lord, am I setting them up for failure? But I just, I, this baby's going to die if we don't get a way to keep it warm. And so the children prayed for a hot water bottle. And then another little girl piped up and said, well, but the older little girl needs a, a baby doll. So can we also pray to the Lord that she will have a baby doll to comfort her because she's lost her mother? And so she's like, oh my goodness, we're, we're pouring water on the, you know, on the sacrifice, you know. So that afternoon, a car pulls into the compound. This had never happened in all of Helen Rosevere's ministry before or since. Drops a package off. She'd never received a package before. Drives away. She goes and gets the children. And she says, children, I don't know what's in this package, Come, help me open it. She opens it up and there's, you know, all sorts of different things in this, you know, missionary box. And she puts her hand in and she pulls out a hot water bottle. And then the children say, oh, put your hand back in because there's got to be a dolly in there too. And she puts her hand in and out comes the dolly, the baby doll. And so this is, these are picture books for little children, but they're becoming best friends with these people who they know personally, you know? And I cannot read that one in particular without tearing up. We have the, these, the series in our home and it's so wonderful. And I love the, as you said, the, be, the good tests for good literature is if we love them too. I love these stories. And the story of the water bottle and the baby, it, every time it makes me cry because God is so good. And it reminds us of, anyway, I couldn't help it. That's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> and then the other series um, from this company is called, what are they called? Oh gosh. What is the, um, the torch lighter? Um, um, the, well, some of them are torch bearers, but um, yeah. We have them over there. They're sitting right here. Do you mind if I pick one out? <laughs> no. Not the lamp lighter? <laughs> no. She, I have a whole stack right. of them. They're right next to me. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, trailblazers. I couldn't think of what they're called. Trailblazers, yes. Trailblazers. So this is John Calvin. This is uh, the Titanic. Eric Little. John Knox. Amy Carmichael. So these are books. And, you know, years ago, I was speaking in Minneapolis. And um, the woman who sponsors my seminar there said, oh, Carol, I wish you'd been here last week because Luis Palau was here in Minneapolis. Excuse me. And he said, um, he told the story of his childhood and he told how his mother read he and his four siblings a continual diet of missionary and Christian biographies and how he attributes that uh, to the reason that all of his siblings and himself are in full-time missionary work today because of the buffet that his mother spread of these wonderful, wonderful biographies. Children need heroes. They need heroines. They need to know that other people had hard things that they overcame, um, that they suffered. Uh, I read a constant flood of biographies. Right now I'm reading about Jonathan Goforth. I don't know if you guys know who he was, but he was a missionary to China and his wife, Rosalind, wrote his story. And after he died, she continued writing about the stories of the answers to prayer they received and things. But this was, you know, around the Civil War era, they were from Canada 
And the suffering that they endured, it was during the Boxer Rebellion. They were almost murdered. Um, their children, they lost, I believe, four children to death from being in China, the climate, the diseases. Um, it just, it's unbelievable. And, you know, I think it's a big trial to like be in the wrong checkout line at the supermarket that, you know, the lady has coupons or something. Like that is a major trial of my faith. And when you read these biographies, it is such a wake up call. It's like getting your back adjusted and now you're like aligned, you know, you, you're like, Lord, forgive me, forgive me for this um, shallow Christian life that I'm living and I need to be reminded that it's not just in the book of Acts, but that people in my lifetime have suffered for your name and glorified your name. People that the book of Hebrews says the world of whom the world was not worthy. I want to be one of those people. Yeah. And biographies are so valuable on so many different levels. I mean, think about just, I mean, the teaching of history. Uh, you know, we put it into these textbooks and we just kill it for our kids and biographies are the, the best way to teach history. Well, I, just talking to you, Carol, it's, I mean, you can't, you can't not catch your enthusiasm. <laughs> and that's really why we wanted to do this for parents because we wanted them to catch the enthusiasm you have for reading and, and literature because it's, it's absolutely essential for those of us who are followers of Jesus. And I, I think you, you, you really nailed it. Uh, the, the God's book, you know, is uh, the, the word of God is in written form. And that, that's, that's intentional. That's not an accident. That's not an accident in history. Uh, he wouldn't have preferred to put his word on DVD. Uh, you know, that, that, that was purposeful. And we are to be people of the book. That is absolutely, uh, you know, it's essential to pass on to our children as we disciple them. So thank you so much for this. Hey, if, if people want to get your resources, give, give them a couple places they can go and maybe spell out your name too, because okay. I, I want them, them to make sure they get to your website. Thank you. So Carol, my mother was kind of creative and used a French spelling. So it's Carol with an E at the end and then joy and then side S E I D in Germany, they reverse vowels. Don't ask me why. So caroljoyside.com is my website. And um, we're really excited. We've just created a kind of a one-stop package that's just brand new. It's called All About Homeschooling. And it's classes that you can um, purchase and own, and they're videos of my teaching. And um, we even have nutrition teaching, um, high school and junior high, how to homeschool for those, and then also for your littles. So it, it spans, you know, a lifetime. And um, so that's brand new. And then on my web store, I have vi uh, audios, I should say, of my basic seminar, which is called A Literature-Based Approach to Education. Then my part two seminar, which is called Begin with the End in Mind. And then we have all sorts of other resources, the blessing and um, preschool and parenting. And um, we even have two on Kitty Lit called Reading Under the Covers with a Flashlight One and Reading Under the Covers with the Flashlight Part Two, which talks about more high school and adult books. So we have lots of resources. And then I also work as an educational consultant by appointment. So that's all on our website. Yeah. So I, 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 uh, I want people to go there because you have been, like I said at the beginning of this, you have been formative in our own life. And, uh, and so we just, we want to open up the, you know, uh, parents to all the resources of Carol. We'd love to see Carol mentor you from a distance, like she's meant to me mentored us. So anyway, Carol, thank you so much for spending this time with us. God bless you. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.